prediction of the model is okay. And, and you can expand your model once you observe some unreliable prediction. So the first question, the practical one, uh, how we can identify these uncertainties? And uh, mm, please notice that I use here the word uncertainty indicator and not uncertainty quantification. So the difference is that quantif quantification means that you have some number which quantify the uncertainty in the same units uh, as energy or forces or something like that. For example, uh, standard deviation predicted by Gaussian process or so on. And certain indicator in his more general term, it means that you have some number which you can interpret in a way if, uh, if model um, extrapolate or not, but maybe it's not directly related to an error of predictions, right? So uh, which, um, which models or which mechanism for uncertainty indication we will cover in this tutorial? Okay, I think we're still. Okay. okay. <clears throat> so we will cover four of them. One is Bayesian linear regression, which is extension of classical linear regression uh, into uh, Bayesian mind setup. Uh, then we will consider Gaussian process, but I think I will uh, go fast over that because that was covered in a great detail in the previous days. Um, another approach called query by committee or ensembling. And the last one is so-called the optimality criterion and max, maximum volume algorithm, uh, which actually is a workhorse in atomic cluster expansion as it is indication. So uh, just one statement, it's just my, my, my thought that I believe that in the long term machine learning models with uncertainty indication in one or another way should become kind of standard or industrial standard in order really to make a robust prediction uh, by these models. But it's just a so. Okay, <clears throat> so active learning. I'm pretty sure you're already common with this uh, workflow. I just remind it a little bit and we will go further. So um, once you have uncertainty indication in one or another way, you can build quite interesting protocols, the simulation workflows. Uh, basically which have the so-called active learning loop, um, which kind of improves the model or find some new best candidates depending on the, maybe this, this particular part of this loop. And idea is very simple. You start from maybe some small amount of real training data. By real data, I mean calculated with expensive DFT or performed by long, uh, uh, time experiment and so on. Then you train the model with uncertainties and I'm, we are not limited to Gaussian process, there is a bunch of them. Uh, then on the other hand side, you can have list of candidates or search space, either it's a discrete enumerated space or it's continuous when you can do some optimization mm -hmm. uh, to find some optimum. And once you make a prediction with uncertainties on this candidate space with the model with uncertainties, you can select next best candidate for um, doing the real experiment based on different um, kind of acquisition functions. And it's just different flavors, but for example, Bayesian optimization, active learning, it just balance between exploration and exploitation. And then you repeat, and depending on your setup, you can either build a model that became reliable in wider and wider region, or you find better and better, more optimal candidate when you have some target properties, then it's Bayesian optimization. So it's just different flavors of tuning of this loop. Okay, so let's start from the uh, short overview introduction about uh, different ways how you can get this uncertainty in education because that's a really important building block for this approach. So um, there's a really good book by Bishop, Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning from 2006. Um, when all this mass is described quite nice. So if you really want to dig deep or start, I really recommend this book. So for Bayesian linear regression, uh, yeah, we, we can start from just problem setup and uh, revise the linear fitting, linear modeling. On one hand side, we have a collection of training points or so sample X, which could be multidimensional one, representing one sample. 
and we could have corresponding target property. In that book, it's called C for target. Nowadays, it's called X and Y, but it's just the same. Okay, once you have collection of these properties, we have the training data set, which has size n number of observations. And for a classical linear model, we usually make an assumption that prediction of some target property for the new observation X is, uh, could be considered in the Bayesian setup as some normal distribution around some, which is centered, which has a center, um, I mean value at around some uh, expression Y, depending on this X and weights, and has some, at the moment, fixed width, fixed uncertainty. Yeah, where is this uh, Y is just a linear model, for example, this particular case is just a Taylor series. You have just increasing number of monomials, uh, but it's could be easily generalized in a way that you have some functions, we can call it basis functions that operate on the input X, which transform it in, in, in some, some way. So actually this transformation from the actual X to the basis functions, we can call feature engineering in machine learning language. But it doesn't cancel the main idea that this is a still linear model. Um, okay, so since we have in mind this linear model with generalized basis functions, but it's linear, why it is linear? Because it's linear with respect to trainable coefficients here. That's the main point. You can have whatever you want here, I don't know, sine, exponent, some complex mathematical functions of X, but it still will be linear with respect to trainable coefficients. That's where this linear came from. Um, okay, <clears throat> once we have this basis and we have our samples, we can construct so-called design matrix, which means for each sample, so one sample, one row, uh, we have rep representation of this uh, sample in this set of uh, basis functions. So you have basis function widths, training sample number of training sample heights, and this is design matrix. And for fitting the classical plain vanilla linear regression, in a Bayesian framework, we can use so-called maximum likelihood approach, which uh, can uh, translating in our classical, like common knowledge about linear regression is just nothing more than least square algorithm, a least square mode method. Uh, so in order to find this weights that stands yeah. in front of our basis functions, we can com 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 compute this matrix multiplication and inversion. Okay, good, but it's not Bayesian regression yet because we have our point estimation. So for given weights, we have some number, one single number that is our maximum expected, maximum likelihood belief in this parameter. It's, it's totally deterministic. Um, <clears throat> in order to go Bayesian, we have to assume that actually we do not have the point estimate. So for example, coefficients in front of function number uh, 10, it's not just some number, but it's some distribution. Maybe it's centered around this number, but it has definitely its width. And in order to make predictions now, we have to integrate out over distribution of weights times the prediction for the given particular um, linear model. Luckily, if we assume that our distribution is Gaussian or normal, we can find a so-called closed form solution, which means with pen and paper, you can find the exact equation, which you can use later. And here we go to the Bayesian linear regression. Uh, yeah, so in order to do this Bayesian linear regression, first we assume that we have some prior distribution over the weights, usually zero centered and have some just initial guessed width of this distribution, um, which is identical to regularization and linear regression. And later, in order to find the actual distribution of the weights, because it's a closed form solution, that's our solution. That's equations for central of the weights and for the covariance matrix. And again, it's all referred to this uh, pattern recognition book, which I really recommend. Okay, <clears throat> so once we have distribution over the trainable weights, we can, this is here. We also have expression for the linear model. We can do this integration or it's closed form solution. And we go to, yeah, here it is. We can go to the prediction. 
uh, prediction is uh, distribute like integration as I already solved, and the final equations is the following. So you have now we can speak about uncertainty. So for new input x, the prediction could be it's it's a Gaussian normal distribution centered around this value where m is uh, equa um, expression from previous slide, and the sigma square, the standard deviation, it's expressed in in this in this uh, term and here you see this matrix S, which actually came from the sorry, previous, previous slide here, which incorporates information from design matrix. Um, so this term is like constant white noise, uh, constant uncertainties, which actually is a hyperparameter, but it also could be optimized in a way, uh, but it's not important for now. So main take, uh, take home message from this, that in Bayesian linear regression, uncertainties in the prediction of new observation introduced through uncertainties of trained parameters, right? In, uh, you can think, and it's quite obvious, in the limit of infinite number of training data, uncertainties of these coefficients should go to zero. I mean, this, this part, second part of this uh, equation will go to zero and you just have classical uh, limit of, of uh, normal linear uh, regression. Okay, so the benefits and drawbacks of this approach. So first, the model is a linear combination of fixed nonlinear basis functions. So the drawback that we have closed form solution, which is similar to least square problem, it brings us to the tractable Bayesian treatment. We can write these equations and use them. And for the suitable choice of basis function, you can in principle, model arbitrary nonlinearities. The drawbacks that if you do not have idea about the good basis functions and you go to the high dimensional input space, number of functions will ex explode because it's exponentially uh, complex with uh, increasing exponentially with dimensionality of the input space. Uh, and now we come to the Gaussian process regression. So what, we, what if we assume that uh, the actual uh, basis set is infinite basis of whatever function we can think of. I just would like to refer to the uh, tutorials from the last two days when this was explained partially. And um, just again, to a little bit fresh in your mind uh, what we're speaking about. So in the Gaussian process, before we introduce the Gaussian process, let's speak about the covariance. Let's say we have no idea about the actual functional form of our dependencies that we want to learn. It's totally random and that's make, so this is just three random samples from this infinite distribution of all possible random functions. But they have some common characteristic. If we consider two particular point on X axis and again, let's say for the red curve, here we have this value, on the second position, we have uh, another value. If we consider this for all type of curves, so red, uh, green, blue, you can think it's infinitely many, we can build some statistic over that and we can compute the average product between value of function in one position and in another position. And you can think of if these two, two positions close enough to each other, probably they will correlate and this covariance it's called covariance, it's, it will be high. In, in, in a strict limit when points coincide, correlation always one, because it's the same point just go one after itself. But if there's two distant point, probably they do not know, they do not feel each other and correlation go to zero. And this like uh, allow us to define type of uh, this random process by providing this joint correlational covariance. Okay, but important point here is that this particular correlation of two observations, we can describe through the kernel computed between two different points, Xn and Xm. <clears throat> so now definition of Gaussian process, it's um, so or from definition of Gaussian process, we assume that our prediction signal Predicted signal is uh, just some randomly distributed uh, value around zero, but with this 
covariance matrix K, which is defined according to these kernels, which means the covariance between uh, correlation between uh, some two observations. Um, and now you kind of shift the problem of selecting the basis set in the linear regression and transform this problem into selecting how this correlation described. So we go from the fixed basis set towards kernels that describe the correlation. Um, but it's still some, like say, hyperparameters because you have to choose the kernel. Of course, there is some recommendation and depending on application we have seen yesterday that could be uh, uh, radial basis function RBF or modern kernel or some uh, periodic kernel depending on your problem. But yeah, that's what you have to provide. Okay, and now in order to make a prediction, we actually have to make like integration over the all observations taking in account that we have this correlation matrix C. And finally, actually our prediction is zero centered Gaussian, but with some uh, specific covariance matrix, which is computed from the train data and the current observation. Um, so in order to, let's say, formally make a prediction of the new test point X n plus one, um, we consider the joint distribution of this n plus one observations, which is zero centered Gaussian processing, but the zero centering is just a prior choice. For example, on the first, first day, the prior cho choice for describing an, uh, interaction within these clusters was some linear trend or so, but it's it, it just for simplicity. The main point is in this covariance correlation matrix. So that's the block matrix here. So the upper diagonal, upper part CN is this big matrix size number of train by number of train data points. And this is just one scalar here, and this is two vectors. When we have just a kernel computed between either train and train or train and test observations. And in order to make a prediction, that equations that we've seen already yesterday, um, I would not repeat them too much, but the main point here that the new prediction is some Gaussian normal distribution centered around some value M computed in such a way with, answer, with standard deviation of Gaussian distribution sigma computed in that way. But actually this M, if we expand this in from matrix to the linear form, it will be sum over number of observations. If you have 10 training points, then it will be 10 by 10 matrix. I mean, the CN, if you have 10 million observation, then it's supposed to be 10 million by 10 million matrix, which is not tractable, right? So Gaussian process, on one hand side, we just came from the problem of finiteness of a basis set in Bayesian linear regression, but we have the same problem just in another aspect, because now we have to deal with the relation between on the training samples. So problem solved, but not complete. Uh, and in Bayesian linear regression, let's say size of matrices that you should deal with is just number of basis functions. You can say, I hit my complex dependencies with 100 basis functions, whatever they are, and that always will be 100 basis functions. Maybe you will have one observation, maybe 1 million observations, but this size used in computer memory is fixed, contrary to the Gaussian process. Uh, luckily, there is another approach, like, for example, sparse Gaussian process, which we would not cover here, but they allow to select from this 1 million of training points, let's say they allow to select the most important 100, and here you go. But this is already like some extra calculation and so on. Okay. <clears throat> Now, um, now let's go to another approach for uncertainty quantification, which is ensemble learning. It's just uh, an, another idea. It's, it's quite straightforward. So I have only two slides for that. So the <clears throat> point is the following. In the typical supervised learning setup, you have a data set. So like order um, pairs of observation X and corresponding target property Y on which you train the model linear regression I don't know, Gaussian process, neural network, call your name. And you get, you get a prediction of this model on the new or on the old data. In ensemble learning, 
uh, data flow quite similar, but either we have not one, but many models, for example, many neural networks that could have different initial guess for the model parameters. And once you train the neural network, they could end up, what is training of neural network? That's minimization of the loss function. And it has extremely complex hypersurface. And if you initialize with different initial guess of weights of neural network, you can end up in different local minima of this loss function. Uh, it means that the models will be different, but they will probably predict very close, even identical value for the uh, observed train data. Yeah, so later we can make prediction from each of this model, average it out, and that would be our aggregated uh, prediction. It's called ensemble uh, aggregation of committee-based learning or query by committee. And in addition to that, we can also consider the standard deviation of these predictions. Let's say we have 10 models, we have average of 10 numbers, and we have standard deviation from array of 10 numbers. <clears throat> and if the training sample came from or close to original training data set, then probably all models will agree in this prediction. And then the standard deviation will be small. But if it's not, if it came from, it's totally new sample, never seen something similar before, then they will be very disagree and the standard deviation be, will be large. Of, of course, this is oversimplification of this process. There are many uh, things that you can tune. So for example, um, here we consider just neural networks, but if it would be some linear models, which has exact solution when you train, it's, it's closed form solution, you would not have any variety in the prediction because all linear models will be trained on the same data set. To deal with that approach, there is an extension of that called bagging, which came from bootstrap and aggregating. And the idea is very simple and nice. Once you have original data, you can randomly select, let's say you have 100 samples. You can randomly select 100 samples from that, but selection with replacement. It means if you once take this blue sample, you put it here, a copy of the sample in your new data set, but then you leave the sample again. The sample has chance to be selected on some next selection, and that's called a random choice with replacement. And then you can select arbitrary many uh, samples now. Of course, there will be a repetition, for example, multiple oranges here or multiple violet here, because it could be just the same, selected many times, but it will be slightly different data sets. So <clears throat> this operation of generating new data sets from the original fixed one called bootstrapping. And later we have the same idea as before. We just train even the linear model, which has perfect exact solution on this subset, so data sets. And again, we can have some aggregation of the opinion, this aggregating stage as, as before. So it's way how to introduce uh, diversity into prediction of the models, even if the models are totally deterministic. Deterministic, I mean, not stochastic in a way that we have the exact solution for, for them. Um, and that's currently the way how, for example, neural network potentials works uh, if, they, if we want to get some uncertainty predicted by, by these models. Okay. Um, just my... Uh, humble interpretation or roadmap of this uncertainty indication mechanism. Not all of them shown here, but you can consider once we live in the Gaussian distribution family, once we assume that we have normal distribution over predictions, over coefficients, over random processes and so on, um, we have either by linear regression with fixed amount of basis functions, or if we take infinite, if we take a limit of infinite amount of basis functions, we go to the Gaussian process. And all that works so like covered or made in a like say Bayesian approach way. Alternatively, so for example, this ensemble learning is like uh, some numerical approximation to this actual distribution, Bayesian distribution of of model parameters, and that could be achieved in a different way. What I didn't cover here is, for example, prob probabilistic programming and Markov chain Monte Carlo, which also allow you to find some distribution of the trained parameters if you do not have closed form solution. So 
This island here is a closed form solution island, which means you have exact equations which you can use and compute it very fast. But um, one sampling, for example, you need to train multiple copies of the models. For probabilistic programming, there is another approach how you can sample distribution of trainable parameters. But at the end, you have some distribution of predictions here or here, which you average out and of which you take the standard deviation. And this is your uncertainty. Okay, and now back to interatomic potentials and atomic cluster expansion. Uh, yeah, so just uh, two slides about let's say, the basics of atomic cluster expansion, which is a, a recently developed method in 2019, the first work by uh, Ralph and Rouse. Um, I would not speak uh, too much from the theoretical basis completeness and so on, that's mostly the practical implementation, how do we compute it and what we gain from that. So now we go from this abstract machine learning X, Y data sets to the atomic particles. So change your mind a little bit and let's consider some crystal structures. And now we're currently sitting on some atom with index I, which has its neighbor, a neighborhood within the cutoff radius, which is enumerated by indices J. Um, in order to compute or like how we build the atomic cluster expansion model. So the first step, let's say second step, we, for each of this bond, for each of pair i, j, we compute a product of radial function times spherical harmonics. Spherical harmonics is very special and extremely important parts of this approach. You will see it in the next slide. Uh, just to remind that spherical harmonics is, um, characterized by so-called orbital index L and projection of this uh, index M, which change from plus minus L with step of one. And they describe, they depend only on the orientation. So that's why for the radial function, it depends only on the distance, whereas spherical harmonics, which depends only on the orientation, doesn't matter which distance. But yes, this is orientation and some particular fixed uh, frame, reference frame, but we will get rid of that rotation variance on the next point. What we gain now is translation invariance because currently all the functions depends only on the relative distance. So we get the first component, which is translation invariance, which means if I switch, uh, shift the whole system by the constant vector, that would not change. Okay, <clears throat> and second point, or the third, we do the summation of this function over all neighbors. And then we get so-called atomic base A. And now we gain permutation variance because it doesn't matter how I enumerate my atoms, one, two, three, three to one, and then so on. This value here is totally permutation invariant with respect to permutation of neighbor indexing. And the next step, we built a product of this single A function up to certain order. We call it uh, correlation order. Uh, for example, if you have just new equal to one, which means just pair interaction, and here you have sum over all pairs. Yeah, but this, so now you can notice that this indices here, N, L, M, they became bold, which means they are not just single value, but it's like a collection, a tuple of them, or multi-index, because they actually enter in this product with this sub subscript C. But it's not rotation invariant. If I rotate my system by arbitrary uh, into arbitrary orientation, new one, uh, this stuff will be changing. So it's it's not yet ready to be used in description of interaction. So now we go. Okay. Uh, and now we go to the following next step. When we build a linear combination of this A product with a so-called special uh, generalized, generalized Klebsch Gordon coefficients. Generalized in a way that, um, so here you can see LR equal to zero, which means that this particular guy is constructed in such a way that once it being summed up over M in this, whatever it means, output value, it's a scalar, and it's rotation invariant. So now I have B function and it is very important. We will use them later on. Uh, so they totally rotationally and inversionally invariant. 
which means whatever, however I rotate my system, or if I do inversion of the system with respect to some uh, inversion uh, point, these values would not change. So they really, so now we collect all previous steps, translational, permutation, rotational, and inversion invariant. And they form a formally complete basis. Because if I will uh, enumerate them up to infinite limits of n L indices and so on, I formally can expand arbitrary function in the 3D cloud space, 3D mean, let's say points of atoms, for example, in a just a linear regression. You can think of this as, I don't know, for example, uh, Fourier basis of different uh, frequencies, or maybe Fourier in the high dimensional space. So practically with the Fourier expansion, you can um, expand any dependency, but you have to cut off upper frequencies somewhere and the same happening here. We just have to limit our basis, but it's formally complete. And after that, so we have some atomic property, which we can either immediately use as atomic energy, or we can build some another mild non-linearities like shown here. And it has another property, which called scale invariance, but it's not the point now. Okay. <clears throat> so why it's so important and uh, what do we gain? We can, with this approach, with this basis, we can define interatomic interaction with quite high accuracy and efficiency. Uh, so, for example, in 2020, that was a work that, like a testing of uh, performance versus um, accuracy, so computational cost on one axis and test score, test root mean square error of uh, energy, whatever, on different uh, data sets with uh, existing up to that moment approaches for, uh, for describing interatomic interactions. So, probably gap potential with soap descriptors, moment tensor potential, neural network potential, snap potential, and Q-snap. And you see one, so uh, each of these types, they form some part at the front, you can see. Uh, it's just uh, increasing complexity of the model, which means that test error goes down, but computational cost increase. And the goal is, so as that, as that paper, the Pareto optimality front, was covered by MCP and by last gap point here, which means that was, that was the best what you can get using these models. With ACE approach, okay, there is different flavor how you compute it numerically, but we shift this Pareto optimality front, which means it's accurate and fast, right? So uh, some, some metrics, for example, the, like we, we have performed implementation of this ACE which is part of official lamp, so you can use it there. And implementation for CPU and typical uh, metrics is 100 to 500 microsecond per atom per CPU core. And also there is implementation for GPUs using the Cocos um, framework by Stan Moore and uh, others, and which can speed it up to few microseconds per atom per GPU, uh, which like opens the route to really fast um, evaluation using all these potentials. Okay, um, so a little bit more about how these potentials is um, fitted. So actually we have this computational flow that we discussed in the previous couple of slides, starting from radial functions, atomic base product and so on. And you can see that this is highlighted here and here. This is actually the trainable parameters of this model. Um, if we, for example, fix the radial function to some predefined list of them, we can, and for example, we assume that atomic energy is just a one single atomic property, then we have a linear model. Linear model with some fixed basis functions, which is a complexly construct, but it's still linear model. So you can fit and you have a linear ACE, but you can do a little bit better. So if you introduce flexibility in the radial functions. So you kind of re-expand them with some trainable parameter here. And you can add some mild, small nonlinearities in the atomic energies. And later, so in our tool called pacemaker that make pace potentials, so performance version of ACE. Um, this flow also implemented, so in the previous slide I mentioned that was implemented on C++ and on GPU. 
This is also implemented in TensorFlow in order to be able to automatically compute the gradients with respect to triangle parameter and use all machinery that is usually used for fitting neural networks. Um, you can get forces, which is gradient of energies for, let's say, almost for free in this outer gradient frameworks, but it's just technical details. You construct loss function, you minimize loss function, and you get uh, your model values. So for more details, if you want to use this, just go to pacemaker read the docs IO, and I would not cover it that much now. Now we come back to the uncertainty indication. So there is another approach. I mean, we cover it by linear regression, Gaussian process, and sampling. I speak about the Markov chain Monte Carlo approach, this probabilistic programming, but it's not the only methods that exist in science to predict uncertainties. Uh, yet another approach came from the optimality criteria and it was first used in moment tensor potentials. And uh, idea is the following. If you remember, you still have to remember that was just 30 seconds ago, that we have expansion or re-expansion of some atomic properties in this B basis functions, which is rotationally, permutationally, translation invariant. So we have this trainable coefficient here and Actually, as we did before, you can construct so-called design matrix for that. So each row here represents one atom. So let, let's speak in, in more practical sense. So let's say you have training set containing of 100 structures. Each structure is, I don't know, 10 atoms. So you have 1,000 atoms in the whole training set. So one line here is one of these 1,000 atoms in the whole training set. and each column represents some particular B basis function. We have some predefined list of them. You can vary them, but it's, it's, it's fixed. So usually it's over determinate matrix, which means it's tall. We have more atoms rather than functions to make the fitting process stable. So we have this design matrix. So the de-optimality approach based, uh, for example, on this maximum volume algorithm in such a way that from this big matrix, I don't know, for example, 100 by 1000, we have to select such rows to make it a sub-select square matrix that determinant of this matrix will be maximum. Determinant in this three-dimensional space has meaning of volume in high dimensional space is hyper volume. That's where the name of this algorithm came from, maximum volume. So if you select so those training samples, those particular atoms, whenever in training set that maximizes determinant, uh, then it's for linear models, it's called the optimality uh, criteria, which guarantees that uncertainty in the learned coefficient will be smallest one. So important point here, from the big training set, you subselect or select subset of rows to make a square matrix. Which, is, which has maximum determinant. Uh, and that's we called active set. Now, in order to characterize uncertainty of the prediction for the new observation, we can compute the following expression. So uh, for new atomic environment, for example, you train your potential. Now you take new structure, which has four atoms. So for each atom, you can construct this I don't know, 100 B basis functions, and you multiply them by this inverted active set and take absolute value and maximum of that. And that's what we will call extrapolation grade gamma. If this gamma, so geometric interpretation is the following. So the uh, black stars here is training data, and those two particular one enters into the active set. So you have two dimensional space, I mean, you should have two samples in the active set, here they are and they form the symmetric par parallelogram. And if your new environment lies somewhere within this parallelogram, then this gamma will be less than one. And then we assume that prediction for this sample would be reliable up to error distribution of, of our trained model. If the new sample lies somewhere outside of that, then this gamma would be more than one. So we have just switching criteria, less than one, more than one. We can also consider how much more than one, is it 1.1 or 10 or 10 million? And the more, the worse. So more extrapolation we have. Um, 
If we, for example, later get the new observations, for example, we add new training data point here, we can update our active set. And now, for example, old samples here remains, but this one extend to that and we get the more wider reliability region. So that's how this the optimality and max wall works. Okay, for ensembling, uh, just very fast, sorry. Okay, so for ensemble learning, okay, that was one favor of one way of uncertain syndication. Uh, in, in this work that I present uh, here for you, we did a comparison to another way of uncertain syndication. That was ensemble learning, which is the simplest and straightforward one, since you have nonlinearities and you do, uh, you can have randomized initial values, you fit the potential with nonlinear minimization, you get ensemble of them, and uncertainty would be deviation of prediction of, I don't know, five ACE models. So a deviation mean maximum uh, distance from the average of total energy or forces on atoms. And that could be another uncertainty indicator. So the next few slides, we will compare those two approaches, extrapolation grade gamma from max wall approach and the optimality and ensemble learn. Okay, so the optimality versus ensemble learn. Um, on this slide, you can see, so first of all, what is the training set? Uh, this is a set contains uh, 1000 copper structures, lies within one EV per atom range above um, ground state, FCC. Um, so that was our train one, copper two train, and copper three, it's uh, very randomized, very big up to dissociation limit and the high compression, so it's a really, really extension of copper two data sets. So we expect that for the copper three, we will discover, or at least we will see that our uncertain indication as the optimality ensemble will show that you extrapolate. So let's look on these plots. On the left hand side, you can see the optimality approach. So either energy error or force errors, depending on our gamma. You remember one is a threshold. You can see it's a strict line here. So for that train set by construction, by definition, it's always go up to one, which you can perfectly see here. So copper two test was slightly different and you have some mild extrapolation here and here. What is important that uh, error for that, so there is a positive correlation here and then here as well. For ensemble learning, you observe the same. There is no strict definition. What should be the threshold? above what you say, okay, now I'm extrapolating. So you can guess, I don't know, for example, what was the maximum error in the train set? Everything which is more than that in deviation is extrapolation or so. And you can see also for forces, so for total energies is not that representative because it's average over many atoms. I suggest to look on the forces. So here you can see also perfectly, like not perfectly, but very good correlation. Be sure this is a double log scale. Um, between this uncertainty and the actual error once and if DFT would be computed. And the same here. Another important point that in the upper uh, left corner here and here, you have no points, which mean if your uncertainty indicator say it's below threshold, it's reliable, but actually error is high, there is no such, such cases. There is no false, false negative. But unfortunately, there is some false positive, which means that a certain indicator is high, but actual error is not that bad. But it happens. I mean, a certain indicator is not the ground truth in the last instance. It's just something that allow you to understand and maybe sometimes be over secure about model prediction. Okay, what is the conclusion from here? Both works. It's good. Both works in this structural uh, extrapolation regime because it was just the same copper data set. Um, okay, the error distribution, I think I will skip. It just shows the same, that uh, it's separate low error interpolation versus high error extrapolation subsets of your observation. I mean, both approaches works. And um, for example, controllable extrapolation, that's what we're gonna do on the next part on the, our hands-on tutorial. Uh, if we take the scope of FCC and we squeeze it to very small distance, interatomic distance, or we expand it up to dissociation limit. So actually you expect the curve something like these black dots. 
and the train proper to data set covered only this small narrow window within volume and energy. So this is a reliable region and you see both, uh, both Maxwell and Ensemble, they show something below threshold, which means interpolation, reliable prediction, but outside it's just uh, increase in, in, in different uh, speed and slope, but most important that it's above the thresholds that we choose. So it's really indicate here yeah, that such kind of environment, so FCC in the high, with the high lattice constant was not part of the training set and you, you, you get it from the model. Okay, another example of two atom collisions, so copper FCC supercell, and you just put together two atoms. Usually you know that if you do not put core repulsion, they could just collide and uh, really uh, and small interatomic distance, both uncertain indicators, they just explode. Okay, that was, comp uh, that was structural one. What about compositional extrapolation? Uh, we use aluminum nickel binary data set from DFT 10B data set from this nice paper, uh, which contains all possible decoration of FCC, BCC, and HCP lattice up to eight atoms in a cell with these two elements. And that was just um, scaled ac according to rule of mixture gets for, for the uh, lattice constant. And we, so, so here we have data set which cover variety of uh, composition from pure aluminum to pure nickel and in between. And if we choose for our training set only those structures which go up to 25% of aluminum, so model never seen 75% of aluminum structure. Could it be indicated by uh, this uh, uncertainty indication? Yes, it can. So you can see that both uncertainty indicators, the gamma and the deviation of energy in that case for ensemble, they also increase. So you see it's uh, log scale once we go outside of our known composition. So both mechanisms, they can uh, show compositional extrapolation when you go to the new compositions, not only the structure, it's the same position of atoms. Is there any chat question or what is it? Whatever. Uh, yes, if you have any questions, you can ask immediately. So both approaches works. I mean, extrapolation in structural degree of freedom and in composition degree of freedom. So we have to choose. Now we have to choose. Uh, and as I already mentioned, we go to this max wall and the optimality, uh, mostly due to the practical reason, for example, for ensemble, you need to train several models. Training of one model, nonlinear optimization, takes time, but you, then you have to do it five times, which is just expensive. For Max, well, you train one model, you compute one active set, and here you go, which is very practical. Okay, um, now a little bit about the structure selection. Now I start to cover different aspects of this active learning loop, and we will see it in a few minutes how it's covered. So for example, for structure selection. So imagine the situation that you want to either fit potential from scratch. You have quite a big pool of candidates, but without the FT calculation yet. Um, and you have to choose what, what is the best subset of my huge candidate structure list with which I have to do expensive DFT and train my potential. So what you can use. Um, once you have um, ACE uh, potential, you can even have it initialized with some, um, I don't know, as, as I mentioned before, the radial functions are also trainable, but you can initialize them with some either delta chronicle symbol or with random uh, values and so on. You can, get, you can get some ACE model without trained coefficient, but with some assumption of radial functions, and you can build all this Maxwell and the optimality magic with it. So by itself, I think I will jump back, but once we select, I just jump back to the active set. What is important in this active set that we select from the overall training set? Again, there is no any value for DFT energy forces here. I can compute this matrix for arbitrary structures without doing, doing any DFT. I mean, I can do it before doing expensive DFT calculation. So once I have really tall, big list of candidates, I can select with this Maxwell algorithm some representative structures, which actually could, on one hand side, they form the active set, 
on the other hand side, the best candidate to use for fit my models because they form this uh, extreme uh, like border region if you want really to, to define your model the best. Because if you choose randomly, maybe you choose a point close to the center, then value of your coefficients would be not that accurate. But if you choose the maximum volume approach, then that would be the most accurate as you can do according to the optimality criteria. So this max wall give you some fixed set of atoms that is best to include to your training. But what if you want to include more than that? What if you want to go further? So there is different ways how you can select the structures. So max wall gives you the fixed amount of them. If you want to go further, our internal numerical experiment shows that you can just, from the remaining pool of candidates, you can randomly sample. So you have from, you start from the Maxwell selection, which is a fixed inside, and then you randomly sample more and more structures, which you include in training set. And then the error on the test set, it drops down quite fast. And it's dropped down quite fast to the absolute limit when you take all structures from the training set. Contrary, if you just randomly select from that, you see it's also dropped fast, but it starts quite uh, with quite larger value of, of error. And most important, if we look on the maximum force error on the test set, max wall selection almost guarantees that you get limited bounded maximum error because that's the most inconvenient samples. Whereas if you do it randomly, it's exponential uh, logarithmic scale. If you do it randomly, your max error just have some convergence, but this is not very, not very fast. So you could have sometimes some really, really, really wrong predictions. So Maxwell kind of stabilize and reduces. So it's one good benefit. Um, just for comparison, there is another one, for example, furthest point sampling, CUR decomposition, density-based method, and so on and so on. Uh, for comparison, I put here the CUR decomposition, but well, it's something in between. It's converged not that fast, but for the maximum error, it's also quite bounded. So makes sense. So may take home practical message for us that we can use max wall for selecting the backbone of our training set. Plus, if we, we want, we can randomly add more structures there just to make potential more accurate inside, inside this uh, access set region. Okay. Now, just again, reminder about this active learning loop, but now with the interatomic potential ACE flavor. So we start from some uh, limited small amount of real training data. We get our model with uncertainties, which I hope I convince you could be linear or mildly nonlinear atomic cluster expansion with, uncertainty, with extrapolation grade gamma. On the other hand side, we will speak about it now. We have some search space. I mean, is it either MZ dynamics that we just run some simulation at, I don't know, high temperature, high pressure, or arbitrary conditions? So we have predefined database of prototypes, and you just populate and make a new structure. So you can have another options. We will cover them. So you have some structures. You have model with uncertainties. You get a prediction with uncertainties. Our uncertainty is done with extrapolation grade. And then you can select your next best candidate. So, for example, active set from Max Wall algorithm, or <clears throat> you can even optimize the atomic positions of the structure in order to maximize its extrapolation grade, and so on. So it's like Bayesian optimization with exploration exploitation regime, but in the flavor of interatomic potentials. But it's the same. And then you do DFT, extend potential, and repeat until some stopping criteria. It could be either manually. Man, man work, or it could be automatized depending on application. So a few examples. First one is active learning when the source of new data is molecular dynamic simulations. And it means that the physical laws of motion will occasionally find some unreliable configuration. And the water example. So um, we start from small, I think, 100 super cells of water with uh, 64 water molecules, um, train initial version of potential, and then run MD dynamics with lumps, and we collect the structures that 
have high extrapolation grades, recompute them with DFT, upfit, upfit, upfitting is just a jargon word, mean we start from existing version of model and we continue to minim minimize loss function, but from this initial guess of coefficient, we kind of continuing improving the model. So we upfit and we repeated 27, 28 generations. And uh, at the end, we are able to run the quite long MD dynamics and that was stable. So like automatically we make a water potential that works for let's say given temperature pressure conditions, but it's was totally automatic. Okay, um, another flavor which I would like to speak about is active exploration, but it's just our name for, um, I think, X exploration regime of Bayesian optimization. When we try to maximize, when our acquisition function is maximum of uncertainty. So models uncertainty, you can call it curiosity, drives the search. So example, first example is uh, lithium four clusters. So clusters contains so four lithium atoms. So four atoms in three dimensional space, it's 12 degree of freedom, minus three translational, minus three rotational, you get six degree of freedom that describes the relative positions of that. And that would be our search space. Um, <clears throat> so idea of this approach that we have some initial version of potential that was trained on dimers and trimers, 1,300 in total. And now we want to train potential that will describe lithium four clusters. And we will generate this configuration of lithium four clusters by maximizing uncertainty, by maximizing this extrapolation grade. How to do it, it's another story. So for example, extrapolation grade is not differentiable function formally because it's maximum and absolute value, uh, but you can still do minimization with gradient free methods, for example, Neldermitt or whatever. But goal is that you find such configurations of these four atoms that will maximize, that will have maximum uncertainty and once you find this configuration, you can, without doing any DFT calculation, can update the active set, pretending that potential have seen this configuration already. I mean, we do not train any coefficients. We do not uh, obtain any radial functions. We just kind of extend active set without doing DFT. We postpone doing DFT calculation. We can repeat it some, I split it by batches, for example, repeated 20 times, we get 20 lithium four clusters with which we can do DFT and then upfit the potential. But that was like postponed. So you can extend this um, active set, I mean, update your uh, region of awareness of potential without, without doing DFT calculation, without fitting, without having target properties. Um, and as you can see, so that's we call active exploration. And if we compare it to the another way of selecting the structures, so we have quite large, I think 10,000 lithium for configurations at our test set. On this test set, we can, from this test set, we can use either, for example, max voice selection, which kind of, if we look in the future, we know what would be the, our training st test structure from them. We select the best one according to max wall and we train potential on them, which means it's a guarantee that it will be the most stable. Um, so as I mentioned, we can just randomly select more or maybe less structures because Maxwell gives you the fixed amount of configurations. Or we do it totally from scratch using active exploration and you can see they go on par, which means potential just discover inconvenient configuration that is should be added into training set to improve itself, right? And the random for comparison is just random is worst case in this scenario. Okay, um, another approach, uh, well, before we have lithium four clusters and you can do this calculation quite fast, quite efficient, but what if we speak about, for example, water supercell? If we will do just, so first of all, we have to do minimization here in, so here we have six degree of freedom. So how many degree of freedom you have in 64 water molecules? You can just imagine it's few hundreds 
and it's intractable to do this reasonable optimization for this uncertainty. We can do it step by step or divide and conquer approach. So for example, we select randomly either oxygen or hydrogen atom, and we allow to move it in, so it has three degree of freedom, we allow to move it from, from its original position in such a way that we maximize the uncertainty within the whole structure. Once it shifted to some new position, let's say we limit it so it should not be this extrapolation grade gamma more than certain threshold, for example, I think 15, then we kind of fix this atom, don't look at this anymore, and we select something randomly elsewhere in the same structure. Uh, so for example, first move was of this atom, then that was this atom, again, we maximize, but in between, of course, we do the update of active set. So this new configuration is pretend to be known, and we try to discover another one. And then we can do this movement until either all atoms has been moved or we have no any untouched atoms. That is because if you move one atom, also its neighbors became extrapolative. So we kind of forbid this region to touch anymore. And we can construct in a data efficiency manner the new supercell, which contains not only one new position, but as much as we can. And what I found nice, so for example, looks on this and on this region, and it's the same structure, but after shift, maybe you can even see the small arrows that was a shift. But what did we discover? Hydrogen transfer. That potential was trained on just MD dynamics or MD snapshots, and you could not expect to observe the hydrogen transfer in this, let's say, reasonable simulation time, like a few picoseconds that usually we use. But with this curiosity-driven active exploration, you can so model, say, okay, I've never seen something like that. That would be nice to know what is it and what would be the DFC energies and forces for this. And we pack it in one supercell and you can repeat it for many supercells and then make this uh, um, iteratively. And that would be another way of sampling the new candidate list. Okay, uh, we will come to this. I just mentioned the workflow with Spacemaker and how we do it so we have initial data set that is stored in the PicoLG zip pandas data frame you will see it on the uh, second part of tutorial then we have the space maker tool which does the nonlinear optimization using tensorflow and gpus which can run i don't know a few hours in the big case of data set and potential after that you have trained potential version you have the training data set and on that, you can use another tool which called Pace Active Set, which will generate you the active set. I mean, selecting according to this Maxwell algorithm, this active set stores in some special file, another file called ASI, which later you can use in LAMPS. So there is pair style, which is officially supported by LAMPS. Uh, it's called pair style Pace Extrapolation, where you provide train potential on active set. Uh, then they introduce you have to take lumps starting from October, November, 2022. That's one when it's most to the develop on release branch. Um, <clears throat> they even introduced the new fixed pair style in lumps, which mean, yeah, what I forget to mention is that when we compute extrapolation grade, we have to do um, matrix vector multiplication. You, a typical basis set size is around 1000. So it's mean for each atom, you have to multiply 1000 by 1000 matrix by 1000 vector which expensive so practically it's be, could be five to ten times expensive just because of this size um, but you and this is quite working assumption you, you there is no need to do it every step you can do it every for example 10 steps or 100 steps just to control if your simulation is okay or if you just collect the data there is no need to take just one after another MD snapshots are very correlated. You still will do some uh, selection with some frequency. So there is option which control how frequent you compute this extrapolation grade. Uh, you can, and this value is computed for each atom. So you can really visually see that this particular atom with its environment has new configuration unknown. So this is per atom property. And if you want to, for example, you can reduce it using this compute style 
uh, by maximum, you, you reduce among all atoms, that would be max space gamma over all structure, whatever is it. So there is option for um, dumping this configuration or not dumping, skip dump, if you have max space gamma less than two with some frequency. And you can even have the fixed height if it's more than some upper threshold. You just stop simulation because it's go too far from the reliable region. It's, it's not seen on this, but on your presentation that you will get, that will be just a link to the lamps documentation with all that stuff. So no need to make a photo, you will get it. Or just Google lamp space. Um, okay, second favor is in Python and atomic simulation environments. So we, we support um, AC calculator, we call it by AC calculator. When you provide your YAML file, you can, so it's not necessary, but if you uh, have, you can set the active set in this ASI file. And then you have some atomic structures for which you can put energy forces. And you also have gamma value. So it's hidden into calculator results dictionary, which you can use for whatever you want. Some gallery um, from, from our project at ICAMS, for example. So here we see different materials a snapshot of MD simulation done in lumps. Uh, for example, platinum rhodium nanoclusters, ice water interface, water liquid slab, or platinum or palladium on silver substrate, which is colored according to this extrapolation grade. Just to have like intuition how good or bad is it. So for example, this platinum rhodium nanoclaster, they were trained on some bulk and open surface structure, but in this cluster, you have some, let's say, curved region. And for them, this extrapolation grade is above one, something like five. So later we, um, let's say, somehow sample similar structure to improve the potential. Or for example, this water potential was trained only on bulk. It's never seen open water surface. And as you can see, it indicates that surface atoms, uh, it's non-reliable prediction. It predicts something, but it's no guarantee that it's reliable. Okay, ice water interfaces, just something there. Or for example, this nanoclusters, you have this contact um, circle between plane and uh, this droplet, which also has some high, but not that much. 2.3, it's okay. I would say that ACE has quite wide, reliable extrapolation radius. So sometimes you can go up to five or 10 and still believe into the predictions. Um, so, but the particular geometry, so it's like this, some contact uh, angle. And uh, because that was never been in DFT training set, I mean, it's not possible to make this angle in a small size DFT cell. That is uh, indicated as um, extrapolation, but it's not that bad, it's 2.3. Okay, small announcement. <laughs> I have to use this. Um, we're planning to do the already second ACE workshop. So if you really want to learn about the whole procedure from, from scratch, from generating the, the full cycle of development of ACE potential from DFT data generation up to parameterization, validation, active learning, and so on. So we plan to organize it somewhere in June this year. And we will, with the exec data, we will put in Psyche mailing list. That would be in Bochum. ICOMS, University Bochum, and it's like limited to 30 participants. So it's in, in a style that you bring your laptops and uh, maybe your data set if you want to train on them, or we can give you ours uh, tutorial one and you will go through the whole tutorial process. Okay, so just be aware that it's good cam and psyche mailing list. And conclusion. <clears throat> so we cover the, we consider some popular uncertainty indicator mechanism. Just remember that Gaussian process is not the only one. It's good because it's uh, like, uh, get you the freedom of fitting arbitrary dependency, but it has uh, scalability limitations and all the ML models as good as your descriptors are. So sometimes it's better to invest your time in the feature engineering rather than model tuning. So we cover quickly the atomic cluster expansion formalism and we also consider the de-optimality criteria for uncertainty indication compared to ensemble-based, select this de-optimality as a workhorse and consider a few scenarios how you can automatically extend training set in order to um, 
improve your potential. And practical recommendation, I mean, that's like a, how, how I see the bright future of interatomic potential simulation, especially machine learning favor, because as you know, we st I start presentation from that, machine learning are extremely good at interpolation, but it's good uh, just theoretically fail, spectacularly fail on the extrapolation regime. And that's the known problem. So in order to tackle this solution, either the smart feature engineering, which give you one, maybe one step of reliability and or uncertainty indication. So I believe that for like reliable atomistic simulation with ML potential, you should have this uncertainty indication mechanism, at least for um, checking that your production simulation do not go far outside of interpolation regime. And for ACE, we have this machinery already. So we can check more at pacemakerreads.io. And with that, thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you. So uh, let's take some questions. I will start uh, by the question in the chat mm -hmm. from Valeria. So is this active learning workflow based on Maxwell or ensemble learning robust to generate a force field by sampling new structures on the fly during MD? Yes, it does. And one particular case was exactly this uh, water, uh, not this, uh, one slide back. Sorry, it's, yeah, this, this slide. So yes, it does, it can. Um, we, we test it not only on this scenario internally, we do it now more and more frequently for different material systems. So yes, it works. But uh, in, in fact, you should not totally rely on this automatic procedure. So we found that the good balance between that that you have on one hand set, you start from physically or your experience-based guess for the structure for certain type of simulator, I don't know, should be open surface, should be some defects or whatever. And then you can improve, first improve this data set with this active learning schemes. Yes. The balance. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Yes. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. A couple of slides before from the end, you said that you stop training or you train every 10 iterations of something. So I wanted to ask, um what that i computed at every 10 iteration oh. yes exactly so what's happening in between those 10 iterations Sorry. it's just um evaluation of energies and forces only without uncertainty indication it's just uh, follows the dynamic equation of motion and yeah like in assumptions that in between nothing bad would happen right right and um I think there was one more, a couple of slides before. Um, yes, I wanted to know what was the dimensionality of your data? Um, um, so the typical data set size, if we speak about the okay, number of functions, number of coefficients, because usually 1,000 or 700, 1,000, 1,500 functions, but due to the nonlinearity, uh, nonlinearity here. So for example, here we have, fixed amount of basis function, let's say 1,000. But then we can consider nonlinear embedding, like here we have two densities, phi one and phi two. And for them, we have independent services index P here. So it's just double that or triple that, but usually we just use this scheme because it's came from finite Sinclair embedding and potential has really good physical motivation behind. So usually it's, let's say, two, 3,000 trainable parameters for binary ternary system. For unary, it's less. For quaternary, it's more. Yeah, exactly. Yes, if we speak about the training set size or this design matrix, uh, so yeah, that's like a few hundred, like 700, 10, 100, 1500, and I don't know, 10 or 100 times more. Again, so it's not active set, it should be design matrix. It will grow if you increase your basis set, but yeah, typically it's a few thousand of DFT tractable structures up to. So let's take one question from the chat. 
this point. We have a lot of questions. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Can the active set and gamma also be calculated for other descriptors like atom centered symmetry functions for neural network potentials? It could be computed for any setup when you have the linear expansion. In neural network, probably you don't, but again, ensemble learning is the usual way to dealing with that. But first time that was used in moment tensor potential by Alexander Shapiro. So we just tried different approaches, show to you two of them, final the one that we compare, and in this final, we just select the, the optimalities and we went with that. And but in principle, yeah, it's, it's just mathematics uh, about the um, linear models. In fact, which I didn't mm, mention that formally it's for linear models. And we, if we have nonlinear expansion, actually our target property is the total energy, which is nonlinear function. If we use embedding here, uh, next slide. I think there is a lack of, okay. So if we use here and in MTP, they kind of linearize the problem around the strainable potential. So in fact, formally speaking, you have to use double the size uh, matrix in a column, column dimensions. But our experiments show that it's just a little bit more over secureness and sensitivity, but formally you can use it whenever you see some linear models in between. So yes, it could be used. Yeah. Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, I have two questions. So first one is uh, comparing to gap potentials. They are known to don't be very good on a long distance interactions like long dispersions and charge interactions. How it's with AC in this case? Um, <clears throat> it's ghost. I mean, we will see it in a, after break. It's not about the potential. It's about the data set. If you, that if we will see it immediately, if you have very narrow region data set, whatever can happen outside, you can regularize, also we'll see it after break, then it will kind of stabilize this behavior without having the false minima at the long distance. But I would say this is just different favor of, of the problem. I mean, it's, you have to use good descriptors in a good data set, uh, regularization and other tricks to making this soup of machine learning potentials. But I would say that in our current working protocol, if you want to develop new potential, we have quite a few sample points up to the dissociation limit just to stabilize potential there. Probably will never go to this extreme large volumes, but just to make the curve looks nice for publication, we add a few points. Okay, thank you. And my second question is going back to the curves where you looked to different uh, uh, convergence of your- uh, For the structure selection. With respect to, nope, the pre this one. Mm -hmm. Have you tried the, the curation of the data set with something like K means clustering or something like that and how it goes in comparison with these ones? Um, Thank you. So K means uh, farthest point sampling density based approach. They work in the, in most of the case, in Euclidean metric in the feature space. Uh, construction of B basis functions that we have here, it's at least in the current implementation, such a way that it can vary ten, eight order of magnitude. It means that if you have one feature met, which may be not very representative, but has large scale, it will totally dominate in all distance metrics, which breaks all uh, FPS, K-means, whatever, because they're based on distance. Contrary to that, uh, Max Wall, it's uh, scale invariant because we multiply by inversion of the matrix. If some row is very, uh, has large values, but it will be compensated because we later divide by them. So actually geometric interpretation of this gamma is the relative volume change. So we tried something based on distance metrics, but it doesn't work at least in the current implementation, unless you somehow normalize the scale. If you reduce the scale, maybe we can go to this more, uh, like locality or distance based uh, way to selecting the structures, but currently Max Wall is the best because it's variant. 
All right, so there's a question from Aksai. So have you tested other optimality criterion like A optimality? Um, no, uh, we didn't. We just, let's say, follow the steps and rules done in MCP and we just think that's the best. Yeah. But maybe it's worse, of course. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that it's useless. No, no, no. So just we use this particular one. Yes, and there was also a question from uh, Turtley. So how does the force field scale with the number of different types of atoms? Mm -hmm. And if you have, let's say, five or six different types of atoms, mm -hmm. can it be used? Mm -hmm. Got it. So in the formalin that we see in here, uh, it's considered exact combination of species type, which means it's combinatorially read badly, scales with number of species. But uh, it's not public work, but I mean, different groups working on that. There is a trick called tensor decomposition that allow you kind of to remap chemistry and radial basis function subspace into one space. And then you, we, we, we recently fit some data set with 31 elements and that was quite good metrics comparing to the literature. So we are planning to release a PACE 2.0 or something like that in the midterm. So practically we go up to five elements that was okay. All right, good. So now we are already a bit delayed from our coffee break. So I'm afraid we have to go there and let's have a half an hour coffee break. And uh, we start 10 past 11. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs>